happy Wednesday. It's Wednesday. Just internalize that. It's Wednesday. Uh, and welcome to Upstage Talks. Um, this is a regular conversation around speaking up and speaking out, even when social distancing. Um, we're super excited to have today two of our uh, friends of Big Smile Co. and also just wonderful speakers, um, Nayela Amaru and Tamika Key. So we're kicking this off today um, in celebration of an upcoming launch for our app um, to start. My name is Maria Consuelo Gonima, um, and I am the founder of Big Smile Co. It's a marketing communications agency at the intersection of entertainment, technology, and philanthropy, but we're also really passionate about public speaking and diversity. So we're launching the Upstage directory. Um, prepare for uh, all kinds of things about that, but we're starting with this podcast, um, or rather this stream, whatever we call it now. It, this is just the world we live in today. Um, but the Upstage directory is the world's first directory dedicated to diversifying all panels. Um, and so again, we have with us today some wonderful guests um, and I'd love to uh, introduce them. So actually we're better uh, representing ourselves through our own words. So Nayela, please uh, introduce yourself. Hi everyone um, and thank you uh, Maria and Lacey for organizing um, this really important webinar. I'm really excited to be um, a part of this conversation. Um, so I am Nayela Amaru and uh, my story does not begin on a public stage. Um, I started off um, Four years after high school graduation in our military, I served in the Army as an ammunition specialist. Um, and through my experiences, um, I learned what it was like to feel like you have no power, because uh, I literally had no power. I was enlisted. Um, and also the layers of being a woman and a person of color really shaped my experiences in the military. And so while I'm very proud to be a veteran of our services, I learned a lot about the importance of um, challenging my own understanding of what power looked like um, and the importance of having a voice. Um, and because I didn't have either of those two things in my experiences, uh, when I transitioned out of uh, the military, when I returned from Iraq, um, I really began to think about what is it that I want to do with my career and in my personal life. Um, and that began, um, that began a journey um, that I have been on for the past um, uh, almost 20 years at this point. Um, in terms of the world of advocacy, I have been a grassroots organ organizer um, in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and if you detect a slight Southern accent, that's where it comes from. Um, and my experiences in organizing, um, I fell in love with the process of building um, but not building alone, but building with people. Um, and that led me to various positions in government. Um, I have worked at um, Atlanta City Hall as policy advisor for a former mayor. I have uh, worked for the city of Atlanta as a grants manager, worked on Capitol Hill as a legislative aide. Um, I have been the former uh, executive director of the Black Latino Asian Caucus uh, here in New York City. Um, and currently I'm a consultant um, and I work with community-based organizations um, on a variety of different issues and legislative campaigns. Um, and I also work with nonprofits to help them maximize their social impact. Um, but all of these um, different roles and positions um, at some point really uh, challenged me to be more in the public space um, as, as, as a speaker. And so my, most of my experiences as a public speaker has come through a variety of different keynotes, um, panel discussions, uh, regular when off speeches, uh, featured interviews. Um, and my topics is uh, mostly focused on women empowerment, um, the political lens, civic engagement. Um, and so I'm really excited, uh, again, for this conversation um, to share with you some of the harder lessons I've learned um, in my own journey um, that I have traversed um, and really sharing with you what it means to be a strong public speaker um, and how that can show up differently for all of us based off of our own experiences. Thank you. Amazing. Thanks for being here. Um, and welcome to Mika Key. 
Hey everyone, so I am Tamika Key. I have a, have a, I come from a different background than Nyla, much more in the corporate and journalism and media space. Um, I'm a former journalist and analyst that worked in advertising and technology for at least the past 10, 15 years. Um, and my career has kind of wound its way through um, everything from writing, which sometimes involved me getting up on stage and doing presentations, to producing conferences and events, um, you know, and, and sort of selecting and being backstage with some of the most sought after business and technology speakers and sort of being able to, to see how they did what they did, right? How they sort of energized and magnetized the crowd. For me, um, I think, you know, the power of public speaking, the power of having a voice is, it's an extension of media, right? Media is, media and, and advertising in particular, I think are arguably some of the largest ways, some of the most impactful ways that we have, um, that people begin to think about themselves and sort of their visions of the future and who they can be and who they wanna be. And so I think, helping people understand how to present their best selves, how to be comfortable when the lens of the media is on them is something that's really important. And so that's why I'm excited to, to kind of be part of this conversation. Wonderful. Um, yes, so today we're here to talk about building confidence for, pu for public speaking online and offline. So clearly now in the time of COVID-19, we are having to become very adaptable. Um, we're having to find what our voices mean behind the lens uh, or even you know, just recalling what it feels like to be in front of a bunch of people and sort of use those same tools to um, engage digitally. Um, but you know, we all started somewhere. We all had our first moment public speaking. Mine personally was like a very public meltdown. Um, but I wanna hear from you. Um, you know, you've told us a little bit about, about the background, but where did it start? Has this always come easy to you or um, yeah, just Tell us about your journey. Let's start with Nayela. Sure. Um, great question. So public speaking has never come easy for me. Um, just some background. Um, I grew up with a severe childhood um, uh, speech impediment. Um, and growing up, um, I became painfully aware um, that speech um, was a challenge for me. And I went to a speech pathologist and I worked through it. Um, but into adulthood, I still carried um, that fear of being ridiculed, of being made fun of, of being bullied um, because I could not articulate words. Um, and I carried that fear and that frustration um, into my adult life and it impacted my career. And I remember there was this moment where um, I made um, I made the decision that I had to overcome at the time what I understood as fear of public speaking um, because I could not move forward and advance in my career the way that I wanted to unless I faced this fear head on. Um, and I, on a very personal level, I believe in the power of manifestation. Um, and once I made that decision, um, to challenge this fear to overcome public speaking, I get a phone call um, from a friend of mine who asked me to deliver a uh, call to action speech to a uh, group of women uh, who were interested in running for public office. So I know you have just met me as of like three minutes ago, uh, but if you want to know anything about me, it is that I am incredibly passionate about women's empowerment and about civic engagement and changing the face of political leadership in America. And my very first instinct when my friend asked me was to say no. It was to say no because I'm not ready. It was to say no because who am I to give a speech to women who don't know me? Um, I'm not running for office. So I immediately went into this defense mode when I was given the opportunity to say no for all these various reasons which may or may not have been rational um, but i ultimately at the end of that conversation i knew that this was the opportunity that i had asked for when i had said you need to get over your fear you need to challenge it and you can't get over it until you really lean into it and what better opportunity to lean into that fear of public speaking than to speak to a room of women who are exactly the demographic and really represent essentially my life's, my life's work. Um, so I said yes. And the day of the conference, um, you know, I, I wrote my speech, um, 
you know, call to action, was ready, you know, to, to share it. And the opening, um, the opening speaker who was speaking right before me uh, was a very high profile, well-known elected official who's also a woman based here in New York. Uh, and this elected official is known for bringing crowds to their feet. Um, every time she opens her mouth, you know, people just give her a standing ovation because she's incredibly charismatic. Uh, she has the ability to connect with people and just an amazing orator. And I watched her deliver this most amazing speech, you know, right before I'm supposed to give my first ever speech. And I was so inspired, one, uh, because she was giving a great speech. But I also was so scared because I was wondering, how can I follow that? I'm not her. I don't speak the way that she does. I don't command the room the way that she does. I can't engage with people the way that she does. Um, they're gonna, you know, the audience is just gonna, you know, go to sleep or throw tomatoes at me the minute I come on stage. Um, and so I'm telling me, I'm telling myself, you know, these, these things. And when it came time, when I heard my name called to the stage, you know, pe you know, she had left the stage, people were still, you know, giving her a standing ovation. Now it's my turn. Um, and I walked to the stage and I'm clutching, you know, my speech, like, you know, like it was just like my lifeline because in a lot of ways it was. Um, and I had this epiphany where I was looking in front of the audience and I said, you know, I'm not going to pretend to be her. Even though what she presented, they loved, they celebrated, um, they wanted more of what she had. But I realized that I am not that blazing inferno that that woman is. I realized that I'm more of a quiet fire and that's just as good. And when I came to that realization, I shared my speech and, you know, did I stumble? Yes. Um, did I forget my place a few times? Um, but in that speech, I shared with the audience the scars that I've earned in terms of being in the world of advocacy, sharing lessons I've learned working in political spaces of what it's like to fight for social justice. Um, and even though I wasn't the perfect quote unquote um, speaker, the content mattered, but more important than that, I think what connected me to that audience was the fact that I was very vulnerable on stage. And at the end of the day, even though, again, I lost my place a few times, I stuttered over a few words, um, probably missed a couple points, I'm sure. But the ultimate goal of that speech was to share my story. Um, and that's essentially what I ended up doing. And so even though I had, you know, 15 minutes before, been absolutely petrified because I wasn't ABC type of speaker, I walked away with this lesson learning that, um, I don't need to be any type of speaker other than myself. Um, and when that manifested in how I connect with the audience just by sharing my story, um, it's a lesson that I carried with me regardless of um, who I'm speaking with um, and the information that I'm talking about that particular day. Um, so I will jump in now. You know, it's, it's funny. Uh, when you talk about having to follow someone who's super inspirational and super, <laughs> and super, and you're like, I'm not that person, but you've got um, this, you're your own, oh, no, it's, you know, yeah, totally. Right. And, and so I think my background is completely different. I think, I, I don't know if you guys can remember this, but I think the first time most people had to do any public speaking was in like second grade when you had to read out loud in class. Right. And like, and no one prepared you to do that. Teacher just called your name and was like, just read. Right. And so, uh, me as this nerdy super nerdy little bookworm as a kid I loved it and then um, and I was a theater major among other things so I've I've kind of spent my life on stage in some capacity right as a dancer as a theater student as a journalist as a um, you know as a as an analyst and now as, as someone who sort of leads panels and conversations and so I think for me it was a little different because I kind of wanted the shine I wanted the attention I was I was very happy to kind of be in that but I I think we talked about this during our prep call I think um, as a performer, there's a bit of 
there's a bit of distance between you and the audience. And so that allows you to kind of be a little bit more confident. Like you slip into this role um, and you don't, not to say you don't have to be authentic, but you're, you're performing. And so it's a little bit less vulnerable and like a little bit less scary. And I think, so my first experiences on stage, I, you know, I didn't think about it. I slipped into a character or I did a choreographed dance. Whereas I think one of the first times I, um, you know, I emceed an event or was a moderator of, um, of a panel, definitely a little bit of fear, right? Definitely a little bit of, um, you know, that, that sensation of the butterflies in your stomach or like your throat is tight, your chest is tight. And, um, but I think sort of for me, one of the, the most important things that, that I kind of had to remember, and I still have to remember it myself, is it's not my job to, to be the smartest person in the room. It's not my job to, it's not my job to shine, if you will. My job, particularly as a moderator or as sort of a discussion facilitator, my job is to make sure that this conversation happens, right? My job is to make sure that if there are three people on stage, that each of them gets a chance to, um, each of them gets a chance to get their point across. Or if, you know, or if it's a fireside chat, a one-on-one -on -one thing, my job is to kind of ask these questions so that the audience gets some of the knowledge from this person. And so I think kind of taking some of the pressure off of myself it kind of echoes what Nayala said, taking the pressure off myself or taking the pressure off yourself, if you're gonna speak, right? To, uh, to not have to be the star, to not have to sort of, to not have to carry all of this weight, I think is, I think is, a, is a good way to kind of go into it and be successful. Awesome, yeah. I mean, so much of what we're doing and why we're doing Upstage is to help people define their own message. Um, all of us have one. and. And in some cases, we're actually speaking on behalf of other people. How do you pull together those message points and, and even internalize them, even though, again, sometimes you are being fully authentic and you are just speaking to your own experience, but other times you're actually thinking about how can you allow the, the others around you shine and how can you represent an entire population of people um, using your very powerful voice in that case? Um, I'll jump back okay. in. I'll Thank jump back yeah. into there. Um, I don't think, so I mean, we can, let's, we'll go to brass tacks, right? As a woman of color, um, there's a whole, there's a whole area of sort of respectability politics and stuff that we could get into with, um, with sort of, do I have to represent every black woman on stage when I go on stage somewhere? I think in what perhaps when I was younger, I would have thought that I had to do that. I would have had to be a specific way and speak a specific way and behave a very specific way because I literally am carrying the weight of all black people on my shoulders. I don't think that I don't think that that is I don't think that's what you have to do. I think it goes back to that authenticity and sort of um, to actually specifically answer your question, I think preparation is key no matter what, right? I think you have to, one, know who your audience is, know the context of the event and the setting that you're speaking in, and that kind of then influences what you're going to wear, how you're going to talk, what anecdotes you're going to tell, and what pieces of information you're going to pull out. And so if I am at, you know, um, I was at a conference um, I remember it was probably two years ago, I was at a uh, Mobile World Congress and I was introducing a session on feminism and marketing and how sort of the next generation of young women um, is influencing the way marketing messages were, were sort of the way campaigns were coming out. And I prepped and I rehearsed and I had a little bit of a sound bite about each of the speakers, but more importantly, I had this kind of fire and this passion of being, I am, I am the woman that you guys are speaking about. I am this sort of empowered feminist woman. And I'm so excited about, I'm so excited that the face of marketing is changing to reflect um, women like myself. And so um, I think that was a roundabout way of saying, in terms of coming up with the messaging um, and, and figuring out how to be your authentic self in a way that connects with the audience, you have to prepare. You have to know who your audience is. You have to know what the context of the conversation is. And maybe to do a little bit of research about either the people that you're on stage with or what you're going to talk about before you talk about it. And Tamika, in your case, you know, not only are you representing your what you your body and your heritage and your past represents, but you're also speaking to technology and the future and all of these things that are really complicated um, for a, a lay audience. How do you ensure that you're speaking clearly about you know, all of those things at once? 
Hmm. Uh, that's actually a really good question. Um, so I think I've rehearsed a lot. <laughs> I know it sounds, I know it, it, it might sound a little hokey, but I, um, you know, the other thing I, I would take one step back and say, I think it's also important to kind of know what your strengths are and, and, and where you fit in. Like, I'm not a good solo speaker. I don't, I have no desire to give a keynote speech because that's just not, I'm not comfortable in that way. I, that's not, that's not the best delivery mechanism for my message. And so, um, so thankfully I've never really had to kind of, um, I've never had to, actually, I don't even know how to answer that question. Probably because I've talked to tech people for so long right. that I, that I don't even think about, um, that I don't even think about the answers. Uh, what I will say is when someone in a panel, when someone brings up jargon or when someone brings up um, something like programmatic advertising or something like that, I would definitely say, can you stop for a second? And maybe for the people in the audience who don't know what that is, can you back up and sort of give us a quick explanation of, of sort of this term or this process? Right. So, yeah, I mean, I'm having watched you uh, for many years in this space, I think you are outstanding at acknowledging that this is new for so many people and how do you create true education and value um, between yourself and the audience and the people that you're speaking to on the stage and the audience. Um, meanwhile, Nayela, you do a lot of advocacy work and speaking on behalf of communities that may not have a voice as much um, and, and that's also requiring um, deep insight on who you're representing and how you're representing them and what the mission is for each of the public moments that you have. Tell us a bit about that. Absolutely. Um, so I'm going to kind of answer your initial question to Tamika because it builds very nicely into how I'm going to answer your question to me. Um, so in terms of talking points, like what, how, how do I decide, what do I want, you know, the, the audience to walk away with? The first thing I ask is, what do I think that the audience um, needs from, from me? Like, what are, what are their needs? So it's not about me when I'm developing the talking points. It's not about what I want to share. It's about thinking, what does the audience need? And then crafting talking points that give them that information. Now, that, um, that folds into the work that I do as an advocate. Um, but I would, I, I would caution and I would, I would clarify, rather, that I'm not necessarily the one in my role as an advocate um, speaking on behalf of communities. Um, as an organizer, I've learned um, to build relationship um, with people in those communities right. so that the talking points that I'm amplifying are not mine. They're coming from the community. I, I, just, certain, I, I just happen to have access to certain people and certain spaces um, where those talking points um, have power and influence. But I'm very, very intentional in no matter my scope of work as an advocate who works with a, a, a variety of different organizations and issues that I am never the talking head, right? If I can, you know, um, I am never the one speaking at a press conference. You will never see me speak at a press conference. Um, what I will do is give that mic and create space on that platform for people in the community who are living, um, who are living the issues to have to have them be amplified. So I think it's it's, it's an important um, process as we grow into our roles as public speakers and add that as a dimension to who we are as as a full person. Um, is to always be mindful that yes, we have our own expertise, well earned. Um, yes, we know what we're talking about, but particularly in certain spaces, it's not about what you think. It's not about what you want. Um, it's about creating space. Um, and giving the mic uh, to other people who know uh, better than you will ever know, um, even with all my years of advocacy and working in, you know, government, um, my best connections in government, um, you know, my, my lived experience, while it's diverse, may not be this particular experience. And so it's not my place um, to be the one to craft the talking points. Absolutely. And I love that about this conversation and especially the two of you being that you both speak publicly, but also encourage others to find their voice, to speak publicly, to gain that confidence. Um, and really just so much of what we're after as the app, as communicators 
is just to help people feel that they have a reason to speak, that they have a reason to even help others to speak. Um, so what do you feel are the best ways that you can do that uh, or that you have done that in terms of encouraging others to find their own voice? Um, Cause even that's hard, you know, like you can only speak from your experience to get to the point that you can empower them. Uh, well, I'll, I'll offer a few things. I think in terms of, uh, you know, what does that process look like to go from being afraid of public speaking, or maybe, you know, you're not, maybe not afraid, but you just want to become a stronger public speaker. Um, I think what's most pivotal as we begin this journey um, is to acknowledge, uh, if we are afraid, um, is to acknowledge that fear. Um, and, you know, to those of you who may be afraid of public speaking, um, and I shared this uh, tip a little bit before beforehand. Um, one of one of the most pivotal lessons I've learned in my own journey as a public speaker, um, again coming from a, a place where I was petrified, um, you know, I still get that tingle in my stomach, the butterfly. Um, you know, my my throat still gets tight. Uh, my heart still beats a little bit faster. Um, Sometimes if, before I go on stage, I'll, I'll be clenching my fist. I'll find myself clenching my fists. Um, I have learned um, to think about the fear in a different way, right? So those physical feelings, that tingling sensations that we feel, um, what if we framed our understanding of what that was? We understand it as nervousness. We understand it as fear. But what if we thought about those tingling sensations that we feel? What if that was our power? What if that was our power that we were feeling, but that we've misidentified those feelings as fear for so long that we've tried so hard to get over it, right? To conquer it. Instead of really learning to grow into it and to embrace that power, because it's that power that gives us the courage to be vulnerable. And that vulnerability on a public stage is what leads to connection to an audience. And when you're able to connect with an audience because you've embraced your power, that gives us an opening into a whole new world that we didn't have before we went through that process. Um, so that's something that I would share in terms of this process. I've given many speeches and panels and interviews and I still get those tingling sensations. Um, and I would also offer um, that I'm still going through the process, right? So it's not like you ever come to this point where I've given a speech in front of a thousand people, therefore I'm good, I got it, I'm not afraid anymore. Yes. I still get petrified if I'm talking, you know, petrified in the sense of those tingling sensations, if, you know, I'm, I'm talking, to two people, right? Because it's, it's not the number, it's the process of really revealing who we are um, and the stories that we have to tell, because those stories are rooted in pain. Um, but the, but the oftentimes, especially in my line of work, when it comes to social justice, um, you know, those sources of pain um, can also be incredibly so incredible sources for our power. Um, and so that's something that I, I have found that has helped not only just me, but in sharing that um, challenge, if you will, of thinking about those tingling sensations in a different way, that it's not fear. What you're feeling is your power. And how can you grow into that so that you can, um, so that you can connect and share your story uh, with other people as well? That's excellent. As, as they say, if you're feeling those things, that means you're doing something right. I, I truly believe that. Um, Tamika, I know you have a point of view on. on oh my God, I love, I, the love fear. I love that. Like I'm taking that Nyella now from now on. I'm like, yes, that is my power. It is coming through. Um, you know, I, I think, um, I think a couple of things, right? And this is maybe a little bit more on the woo woo side, but I think in addition to the preparation, which I would come back to, you have to breathe. Right? Like it sounds so simple, but you have to breathe. And because when you, when you actually, I think when you are nervous or when you're about to go up on stage and you have that clench and you're tapping into your power, a lot of times people don't realize they are not breathing. And when you are not breathing, you're not giving your brain oxygen and you're not doing any of those things. And so you really force yourself to stop and like take a deep breath. First, it lowers your heart rate, which kind of then I think 
reduces some of the anxiety, forces you to kind of unclench your jaw. Like, I mean, literally like do a breath, like, <sighs> you know what I mean? Forces you to unclench your jaw, take some deep breaths into your belly. It kind of forces you to stop squeezing. And, and I think again, it, it sort of regulates your nervous system and kind of, and, and perhaps allows you to tap into that power. So it's not fight or flight anymore, right? It is, I am calm, I'm centered, I'm grounded and I'm ready to go. And I think the other piece that I would come back to is sort of that preparation and even rehearsing, rehearsing in front of a mirror to see what, to see what your mouth looks like when you say things. I have like this crazy expressive face and I've had to learn how to, you know, especially when you're having a conversation about tech with someone that maybe you don't believe that their product does what they say it's going to do. You have to kind of fix your face so that you don't you know, make a weird face at them. But again, even rehearsing in the mirror to kind of feel what it feels like to say those things, that repetition can help ease your anxiety. And I mean, one of the best examples I have is, um, having done this for so many years, I got, uh, I got invited to host an award show. That is canceled now, obviously. But I got invited to host an award show. And I almost said no, because I'm not, I'm not Vanna White, right? Like I'm not a presenter. I'm a business analyst, you know, who does these very serious business things. And something inside me was really afraid and really nervous. And I said, okay, no, I, I need to go with this, right? I need to go and do this. And there was an awards um, event that was supposed to be in France. And it was the first time that the company was doing the event in English as opposed to French. And so I took the advice of someone and I learned a couple of French phrases and I practiced them in the mirror multiple times over and over again. And that was how I was going to, to, to sort of, that was my understanding of how to connect with the audience, how to be a little bit vulnerable, but then also how to do what I know how to do best, which is prepare um, so that I could confront the fear and the anxiety and sort of at least um, be in the space where I felt like, where I felt empowered. Sadly, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not in France and we're not going to be able to do that. But I think, again, I think if someone, um, if someone's watching this and they've never spoken before or they've spoken and they've been a bit uncomfortable about it, I can honestly say prepare and breathe, prepare as much as possible. Um, rehearse. Don't be afraid to like literally say the words in the mirror because it, it, it helps your body. The, the, it creates the muscle memory so that when you're on stage, it's almost like your body remembers what you were doing in your bathroom mirror. That's, those are great, great points. Absolutely. I think the connection with yourself really enables the connection with the audience. Um, and so I've heard you both say in different ways, you know, in the beginning, you felt that you, who, who am I to be this person? Who am I to speak to these things? Um, and we're all experts in different things. So it's not like you have to pick one lane and just stick in that lane. Um, but how would you recommend that somebody find their lanes and really feel confident to build upon those and be that person? Um, I can go first only because my lane has changed a few times and I think that's perfectly okay. Uh, and that should be our story, right? Um, you know, I, as I said, you know, in, in my intro, I started off as an organizer, right? So I was knocking on doors, organizing protests, you know, that's, that's what I did. Um, whereas now I'm in a space where I, you know, um, am influential in um, a very political sphere. Um, and I'm not necessarily the one, you know, knocking on doors, uh, although sometimes for a good cause, I absolutely will. Um, but my, my label of how people have understood what I do has changed a few times, right? And I think it's important for us um, as we continue our journeys um, is to not fall into this trap of thinking I'm an organizer and that's just how people understand me. Therefore, this is my lane. Um, you can choose to stay in that lane if it's aligned with your values and it sets your soul on fire, the work that you're doing. Um, and if you come to this point where you're, you, where you know, just like I, I went through this process of I love organizing, but I want to organize in a different way. Um, and that led me to quite a few different transitions where in many parts I'm still organizing, but I'm organizing with different people in different spaces, right? Um, I think it's important for us that we define who we are um, and nobody else, right? Because I think as long as we are the ones that define the lanes that we want to walk this path in, 
um, nobody else can say, you can't speak to this because you're not X, Y, Z. And I also think it's really important, particularly for women and people of color, um, is that in this country and the world in general, oftentimes authority and expertise um, is given, quite frankly, to straight white men. Um, and oftentimes we have to overcompensate as women and as people of color to justify why we are speaking on this particular issue. Um, and there, there comes a point where you know, you can continue to try and validate um, why you are in this room. Um, and it's a very personal decision. Um, and continue to prove to people over and over and over again, I have the credentials, I have the experience, however, so, however you so choose to define that. Um, or you could just show up in the room um, and not owe anybody any explanations um, and know that you are there because you deserve to be. Again, a very personal decision, um, one that I have gone back and forth in my own life of like, you know, you're questioning who I am to be on this panel. Um, well, if you Google me, you would know that my resume is longer than a CVS receipt, please and thank you. Um, but those, again, are very personal decisions, right? Um, so with that said, I think that I said all of that to say is that the power of the lanes that we choose to do the work that we do, let that be our decision and nobody else's because people will define you if you let them. Um, I am not just an organizer. I am not just a lobbyist. I am not just a consultant. I'm all of those things. I have all of those lived experiences and no one is going to tell me that you can't speak to organizing anymore because you work on Capitol Hill. Says who? Says you, not me, because I have been an organizer and I've organized at far more levels of government on far more issues and have far more winning campaigns um, than you do or that you know, so you will not define for me what I can speak to. And the power of owning our expertise um, and the power of understanding our expertise as lived experience, right? We are not experts because we happen to ha have 30 years experience. We're not experts because we have PhDs or because we went to school. We are experts because we have the experience that we have lived. Um, and that counts just as much, if not more, um, than people who are on panels or giving keynote speeches or have feature articles in magazines uh, who have no idea what they're talking about because they don't come from that particular experience. So that's all that I would offer in terms of how do we decide you know, our, our lanes that we want to work within? How do we want to be known as experts? You decide, nobody else, own your experience, your lived experience matters, um, and live your life and define your own boundaries so nobody else will. Absolutely. And I know, so, so that brings up to me sort of a matter of tokenization as well. There's like the, I'm going to be bold. I'm going to have my voice. I'm going to be the one to, to speak to the things that I know. But at the same time, people who put you in those places and maybe even unintentionally want to just check a box of diversity. So Tamika, you know, can you speak to sort of the, the former question, but also um, <clears throat> the, the matter of tokenization? Yes. So I would say a couple of things. One, <sighs> I think, um, you know, the situation, the current situation that we're in with is creating lots of challenges, but it's also creating opportunities like this. And um, so anybody can, literally anybody can make a webinar. I mean, we could have did it before, right? But now anybody can make a webinar. Yesterday, I, there's a musician I love. Uh, his name's Tall Black Guy. He's like an instrumentalist. And he posted on Instagram that he was going to be doing an Instagram live stream with a saxophone guy. And I love this musician. I've never seen him live. Um, I've, I've just, I've been a fan of his for a really long time. And so last night at 5 p.m., I tuned into his Instagram live stream with this other saxophonist. And it was choppy and the, the screen dropped a couple of times. But these two musicians just had this great chat and interacted with their fans a little bit and talked to each other and talked about music and were authentic and a little bit vulnerable. And it was the most, and, and I mean, I tuned in for 25 minutes and it was the most, it was the delight of my day yesterday, right? Like to see this, to see this musician who, he was just in his element. And the point of that story is anyone can create a megaphone now, 
right? Especially now in this time. And so if there is something you're passionate about, if you are all about sound baths and healing, if you are all about making masks for other people, if you are all about, you know, cooking from home, if you're, whatever you're kind of passionate about, you have the platform now to be able to speak about it. You have the platform now to be able to, you, you can create your own lane. And that's, that's kind of what's interesting about this time because we all have time. And so now everybody's kind of tuning into these different things. And so I think, you know, to kind of echo what Nayala said, don't let anybody tell you what you, what you should be speaking about. I do think that you should, if you're going to sort of speak, bring something of value to the audience, bring something truthful to the audience, bring something hopefully factually researched to the audience if you're gonna tell them about something. But like, pick what you're passionate about and go do it. And you'll actually, you have no idea how many people you might surprise and delight with your 25 minute live stream on Instagram. So that's, you know, that's part one. Part two, tokenization. So having worked as a conference organizer um, for a number of years, you know, I, I would definitely say, um, probably at the beginning of my career, at the beginning of my career, it was my intention to find women and people of color and stick them on stage um, whenever I could. And I will admit that sometimes they probably weren't the best fit, but because I was like, no, I want somebody brown on so we can not have a whole day of, white men on stage um sometimes i think there was some tokenization at least in my selection of people because i was like oh shoot you're brown you work in advertising i'm gonna put you on stage and maybe they weren't the right fit and i totally get that i definitely think within the within within the past five years within the past four years the focus on diversity and inclusion can create some situations where you wonder if this brown person that is on stage should actually be on stage. <laughs> um, but I think I think it comes back to I think it comes back to knowing what you are passionate about, knowing what you can speak to confidently and effectively, and also and also knowing whether you are a good fit for this. Like, what is the organizer's intention? Right? Are they, did they come to you and say, hey, look, I know I've seen, I've seen your tweets about this, or I saw your Instagram feed and I know that you are all about baking sourdough bread and we have this whole thing about sourdough. Check their intentions to see whether there is tokenization going on. But, but I also think that it's hard to, I don't, I don't want to contradict myself, but I would say it's hard to, to, to say tokenism when people, when brown and black people have not had a seat at the table or haven't been able to be part of the conversation as much as other people. So I think it's, I think it comes back to knowing what the intention of, again, back to knowing what the audience is and what's the intention of the conversation. And is this a workshop about being your authentic self? Is this a workshop about, you know, about how to, if this is a conversation about how to craft how to craft business marketing copy that speaks to a specific audience. That's one thing, right? If this is a conversation about um, being your authentic self and bringing that to the table, then that's, that's a different conversation. So I think it depends on the audience as well as the intentions of the, the sort of organizer as well as your passion. Totally. And I think, you know, just to be fairly honest, sometimes I, I use it as a, as a point to say like, I'm a Colombian American, um, I'm bicultural, bilingual, I am an entrepreneur, I work in tech, all these things, like look at all the boxes I check. <laughs> so, um, you know, sometimes that's to the benefit and other times I think we should at least acknowledge that we can be, I mean, tokenize, it's sort of the darker word of it, but also being given the opportunity to to have a voice that may not be heard typically. So, you know, one of the main things around Upstage is that we want to be able to showcase that people have their different lanes, that people want to um, find diverse voices. Because as we're speaking to different conference organizers around what we're doing, they're saying, you know what, that's one of those things that I really want to focus on is having different points of view and different lifestyles. And it's not only about race, color, all these things, it's about just identity in general, um, areas of expertise and diversifying across all those levels. Um, so one of the main points I always say is that we're not like angry at the 
older white man. Um, we just want the older white men to open up the floor for others. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think, I think this has been an incredible conversation. I think we're going to start opening up for questions, but is there anything else that you want to add um, to, to what we've said thus far? I th actually, I agree with you. I said that too. Um, there was a, probably about a year ago, I was producing a virtual reality event and there was a speaker who I really wanted to have at the event and I hunted him, you know what I mean? I found him, I tweeted him, I linked in him, finally got his phone number and I called him. And I remember him being like, I mean, he's like, it's fine if you want an old white guy on stage. And I said, yes, I want an old white guy on stage. I just don't want only old white guys on stage. I said, but you're actually, an, you are the expert in this field. You are exactly who we want to have this conversation, but maybe I'll have you as the tech expert and then I'll get a brown creator who, who actually works with, you know, who actually uses your product to create experiences. And then I'll get an advertiser who's going to use your product to tell somebody else's experience. So I think I, I want to echo your point about diversity, not just being in terms of skin color and gender, but also in terms of opinion. Like, why would you have, you don't want to have everybody who has that same view and perspective, because then if it's a panel, right, then you don't have a diversity of, of opinions and then the conversation kind of gets boring. Absolutely. And there, I mean, it, across every industry, there are times that you see the same faces and the same com uh, the conversation, the same talking points, and you just want to see something different. I mean, the whole world has changed now, but so many conferences are based on, are, are huge cash cows for um, companies like publishers or um, consulting firms, other things like that. Um, why is it that we are seeing so much uh, consistency or, um, you know, sort of baseline and Again, the, for the app, we keep hearing from people, oh, that's exactly what I need. So, um, you know, how is it that we're going to help each other evolve in these spaces? And, um, you know, especially now that we're online, what, what do you think it's going to take um, for people to get propelled out there? Can I, can I jump in? Yes. Um, this, is, this is Lacey. Hello. I worked with uh, Maria on App Big Smile. We're working on the Upstage directory. I have a question from an audience member that I think yes. dovetails with that very nicely. Can Absolutely. you speak about social impact messaging coming out of COVID-19 and how this can be leveraged for policy shifts and systemic change? So very similar to what you just asked, actually. Yes. Um, wow. Uh, and I mean, Nayela, I don't know if you want to jump in on that. Yes, great question. Um, so I take issue with the messaging, we're all in this together, um, because it is a very flawed reality. Um, but unfortunately, that is the message that uh, mainstream media is amplifying and leading with that, you know, you know, we as a nation, you know, are, you know, going through this um, process of, you know, trying to recover from this national uh, global uh, health pandemic. Uh, but the reality is, um, is that we are not all in this together um, because some of us have the privilege, uh, myself included, of being able to work from home um, and being able to pay my bills um, because I have not been laid off. Or I'm also um, not working in an occupation where I am you know, being where I have to put my own uh, health at risk um, because I am because I have to work, right? Um, and so when we're looking at who really uh, works in those types of positions, uh, we cannot ignore uh, the racial class um, uh, dynamics of this pandemic um, and who was suffering the most. Um, and that also is reflective of, you know, who was dying, who, who, um, who is not getting the treatment that they need, right? And that's a reflection of our healthcare system. Um, but the healthcare system really is a reflection of greater social issues that are rooted in uh, white supremacy um, and how that bleeds into racism and implicit bias. Um, and so I think that when we're talking about social impact messaging, that we're not putting forward messages that still, that still center the most privileged, right? Until we center the people at the edges of those margins, um, then you'll really begin to uh, really develop policies um, driven by messaging um, that focuses on the people who need the help the most and not those who need help the least. I, that just, to me, all of this 
begs the conversation around um, consistency and consistent messaging and the fact that the media is so decentralized and that our voices are so decentralized that we're hearing all kinds of different things from all kinds of different people. Um, and that certain communities that have access to certain information are hearing wildly different things from those that, that do. So I think this, you know, I don't have the answer to that, frankly, but it is um, just one of those things that like, how do we use our own voices in our own channels to spread that, um, spread the messaging that we do believe to be correct. Uh, I think that's also just like, what do we think? Ah, I don't know. I just walked myself into a circle. Help. <laughs> <laughs> I can ask another question from the audience. Um, yes, do you both yep. actively seek speaking engagements? Um, do you have an agent or agency or have past experience working with one? Or if uh, not, I guess, how do quick. you find speaking engagements or do people just come to you? <laughs> um, my answer short is no. Um, I have found that speaking engagements tend to be get more speaking engagements. Um, I'm not a, uh, like a professional public speaker who does this for a living. Um, I think that those people have, have agents. Um, but for me, my speaking engagements, um, nine times out of 10, come from someone who's heard me speak before and think of me as, oh, I heard you speak at such and such. Would you be interested in speaking at this? Um, that's how I tend to get my, my engagements is by word of mouth. Um, and no, I, me most of the time being on the other side and the booking of the speakers. So no, I don't, I don't, um, I don't have a speakers bureau. I don't actively, I did actively start seeking out speaking opportunities, um, in the virtual reality space when I wanted to move into sort of virtual reality. So what I, I guess I would say is. I will echo what Nayala said. Yes, speaking engagements beget speaking engagements. If you are trying to break into another industry, then yes, go after them, pitch yourself, set yourself up. Um, I think, I don't know about um, finding a speaker's bureau. I think that's a little bit chicken and egg. It's almost like they want you to have spoken a couple of times before they will represent you. And then sometimes it gets, and sometimes it gets, um, it gets a little, uh, sticky with kind of them packaging you as a very specific speaker in a very specific way so i think unless you unless you're trying to promote your book or like really sort of have a clear message and a career path that you're trying to to sort of build with that speaking i don't know that um a, that trying to find a speakers bureau or an agency is is the best route i think there are so many people who might not even know that those things are options um, you know, I think that's sort of, again, why we want to do Upstage um, and create sources or resources for people to um, find ways to record their own video and find their own ways to speak to their talking points and create channels for themselves. Um, so yes, a lot of that is, uh, you know, some of these things just come naturally and other things are actually just sort of fabricated through communications agencies for example um <laughs> but but often with very direct purpose and um and the the method so again one of those things being you know shoot and cut your own reel of yourself talking or have you been on another thing so the more you do it, it does beget more speaking engagements whether that's something you want or not is the question but if you do then just do more um, we have a follow-up question from that. Um, do you find speaking opportunities through digital networks um, like Twitter or LinkedIn, or do you go to conferences to pitch yourself directly? And I would add to that, I think, Maria, maybe if you could explain a little bit more about Upstage and how it will work specifically for this kind of thing, I think that would be good. Sure. Um, well, do, do you want to comment sort of on, on oh, well, Let's do it this way. Okay, so uh, from uh, the upstage standpoint, it's going to be not only giving people the tools to um, be empowered to create their own uh, platform, um, but also, you know, there are so many different ways to do it. I think these examples, the um, digital networks, so social media, uh, and also going to conferences to pitch yourself, those are both options, um, but there are just so many different methods that you can find to find to share your own voice to create um platforms for yourself like like most things if you have a clear voice on twitter 
and you are able to express that to someone, you can actually find someone on Twitter and just tweet at them. But ultimately, that's what we want to make Upstage for is a centralized place for you to build your voice, share your voice, um, find others who want to hear your voice and create opportunities for, for yourself. Um, but in the same moment, create opportunities for those who share um, or maybe even oppose your point of view. Um, I would just sort of add to that. I, yes, Twitter and LinkedIn and, and, uh, and, and various social channels, but I would say it's a two piece. Follow the conferences and events and media companies that you really, if, if, you, if you're interested in kind of building your speaking experience, follow the conferences and the media companies and the things and the agencies that you like, see what they post on Twitter and Facebook. And a lot of times with most events, there is a call for speakers, usually. They, you know, they tweet out a thing and we're like, hey, we're looking for people to speak at this and then submit yourself. And um, as a conference organizer, though, I guess the one sort of secret tip I would say is send them as complete a sort of submission as possible. And like Maria said, include your picture. If you've got a video, if you made a funny Instagram thing, send them a link to that. Include a title of your session, include sort of the key takeaways, what you think people will, will get from it. Because most of the time we get so many, um, we get so many inbound requests and it's like the most complete ones at, like get my attention instantly because it's like, oh, you've done a lot of the work for me and then you seem prepared and you seem like you're gonna be a good person on stage. So I would definitely say, if you're interested in that, put your best foot forward when you do apply. I would also add um, the, the impact that visibility has um, on social media when it comes to speaking engagements. Um, you know, I, I have not um, been intentional about, um, you know, getting speaking engagements um, through LinkedIn or, or through social media. Um, again, because most of my um, engagements have come through referrals. Um, but I, I do know that it, when you engage in a conversation, whatever your industry may be, um, that that amplifies um, your perspective and your opinion. Um, and to not be afraid to share your opinion, right? Because people do it all the time with like, no basis in facts, right? So if you know what you're talking about, which I'm sure everyone on this webinar does, um, don't be afraid to share that perspective, right? Um, I do know I have been reached out to um, uh, a few times um, when I tweet, um, it's an election year, every year is an election year, um, on presidential debates, um, sometimes um, through my lens as a woman of color, um, I'll address, you know, the issues within the, you know, progressive movement of what they're doing right, what they're doing wrong, um, through my lens, um, you know, as someone who's not a white progressive. Um, and I have found that when I share those opinions, um, that because it's so different, no one's talking about how racism can show up in social justice movements. I do. Um, and so I get to talk about it on panels, um, you know, and so I would just say that the importance of visibility, whether you choose to be super engaged on Twitter or whether you choose to, you know, write a letter to the editor um, or an op-ed, you know, don't be afraid to own your own opinion, right? So there's expertise and there's opinion, both of which play their role in shaping uh, public discourse. Um, which can impact policies and how we're talking about those issues. Um, and all of us have, you know, our own different perspectives because we come from so many different places in our own walks of life. Um, and all of it matters, right? Um, and the issue is, again, when we're talking about, at least through, through my scope of, you know, public policies and programs, um, only certain narratives are being amplified. Um, and so how can we... Um, you know, being a space to help be a resource and to help amplify um, different perspectives. And that begins um, with people like you, you know, on the call in terms of what are your opinions, what are your thoughts, what do you know to be true? Um, and share that with the world, uh, because I guarantee you, whatever you think to be true and to be right, there's someone on the other side who will challenge that. Um, and that's how we have productive, meaningful conversations that can really lead to impactful social change. Um, is that when we have these conversations, right? Um, and so I would just offer that um, in terms of like visibility, don't shy away from it, which is something that, uh, again, was brought up in the beginning of this conversation. Um, 
I, I have shied away from it. And now, you know, moving into a space of understanding the importance of being visible, however you choose to lean into that, again, however, you know, Twitter, social media, or um, letters to the editor, you have an opinion, you have a different point of view, own it, don't be afraid to share it, because that's the beginning um, of really important conversations that we need to have as a society. Absolutely. So one of the things that we say at Upstage is that we're trying to upstage the status quo. And that is, uh, we're trying to say that in so many different ways. It's about um, making sure that your voice, you don't want to come into something being the opposition, but you want to have the space to oppose. Um, and that's just the beauty of language and that's the beauty of our own um, points of view. So I'm super sad that we have to wrap this up. Um, I'm so grateful to you for your time and for everyone being here. Um, really excited to share with you. Oh, hello, Katie. Um, really excited to share with you that we have a few other panels already booked. Um, many thanks to Lacey and her organizing uh, these events. Um, we have one on May 6th, 6th, that is Networking Strategies Digital and IRL in real life, for those who do not know. Um, May 13th, Storytelling 101, Crafting Your Message. May 20th, Reaching the Right Audience and Digital Strategies for that. Hi, Cat Tail. Um, he's wanting his little star. He's got his moment. Um, so, uh, yeah, so much gratitude to you both. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, and uh, for those who want to hear more, um, please reach out to us. Please come back for the next talk. Thank you so much, Maria and Lacey. And thank you so much, Nyla. Nyla. Thank you so much, everyone. Take care, everyone. Be safe. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.